Okay, I think we are live. We hope. Um, let's just wait a couple of more minutes um, for everybody to join in and then we will get started. Okay, I think I think it's time. Um, good evening and welcome. My name is Anna Heller and I am the Bruce A. Beale Director of the Rollins Museum of Art. And as I say, I realize that this is our very first event with uh, our new branding. Now, technically, we're not officially the Rollins Museum of Art until the opening of our fall exhibitions in September. But since tonight's lecture and the exhibition that the lecture is about will be um, opening, the exhibition is opening in September, and uh, the title of the exhibition and of the lecture uh, includes the very new name of the museum, American Modernisms at the Rollins Museum of Art, we figured it made sense to use it tonight. Now, many of you, I think, are already familiar with tonight's lecturer. Dr. Grant Hamming, because he has been for the last two years our research fellow here at the museum. Um, and he has delved very deeply into our entire collection of American art as part of that um, research fellowship that was generally, generously funded by the Henry List Foundation. Uh, Dr. Hamming has a PhD from Stanford University and is a specialist in 19th century American art. His dissertation explored the work of a group of American painters who in the 19th century, in the years preceding the uh, beginning of the civil American Civil War, lived and worked in Dusseldorf. He's equally at home in, in Af American modernism, African American art, printmaking, and graphic design. Now it is American modernisms that he will talk to us about tonight. And the exhibition that I referenced earlier, which he curated, American Modernisms at the Rollins Museum of Art, which opens to the public on September 18th, uh, was the result, one of the results, of his extensive research on our American collection here at the museum. The exhibition is really important to us because it aligns with, well, because it's yours, Grant, but <laughs> Also, I saw your smile there, so I had to. Um, but also because it aligns with a very important, I think, and, and larger effort in our museums to create a different narrative from a broader perspective and uh, through the lens of diversity of inclusion of the story of American art, moving beyond the traditional canon that we have all accepted for so many years. and for his very expert placing of our own collection within these efforts and for curating this exhibition in a way as a case study, I am very grateful to Dr. Hamming and very much look forward to the imminent installation of the exhibition in the galleries. I think today we finished paintings, painting, repainting the walls. So it is uh, going to be going up very shortly. So without further ado, I want to um, pass the virtual mic to Dr. Hamming, um, but not before I mention, I think you all know the drill by now, please put your questions and your comments in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the lecture. Dr. Hamming. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. It's so wonderful to be back here at the museum, even if virtually. Hopefully I'll get down there again in person sometime soon. And thank you all for attending as well. I look forward to sharing with you today and I welcome your questions afterwards as has already been mentioned. I would also at the outset like to extend my sincerest thanks to the Henry Luce Foundation uh, and the Art Bridges Foundation, both of which provided instrumental support in the creation of this exhibition. So today I'm gonna talk to you about this exhibition, American Modernisms at the Rollins Museum of Art, which will open in a couple of weeks in the Clive Gallery. 
It represents the culmination of a year and a half of research I did as the American Art Research Fellow at what was then known as CFAM, and which will of course soon be officially known as the RMA. And I'm excited that the exhibition is opening at this particular moment when the museum is embarking on its new identity. In its stroke of serendipity, my research into the American collection is like the collection itself, which is to say it's based in the past, but absolutely looking towards the future. <clears throat> Speaking of the past, a theme of the exhibition and thus of this talk is that the past history is not a single story, but rather many different stories, all of which jumble together, overlap one another, meander back and forth, and otherwise behave with all the unruliness of the human beings who create and tell those stories. As I've said before on my blog and at other talks for the museum, my job as the American Art Research Fellow was, in many ways, uncovering dozens, even hundreds of these stories. One of my favorites concerned this painter, Elizabeth Murray. Murray is perhaps not a household name, you may be thinking, in the way that some of the other figures you'll encounter on the walls are. She's more like what we might call a painter's painter, <clears throat> which is to say that other painters are usually fans of her. She commanded the respect of her peers, as well as of curators and gallery owners, even if she escaped the, no the notice of much of the public. Due to a variety of factors, including her gender, the fact that she died somewhat young, and the fact that the painting, that painting became a little outmoded just as she came into her own as a painter, she didn't achieve superstar status, but oh well, artistic celebrity as such doesn't interest me. What Murray did possess was a really sharp mind, a thoughtfulness about painting and about her place in the art world. So anyway, back to the story. I'm at risk of repeating myself here because I opened the exhibition's catalog with the story, but I think it's worth it. In 1994, Murray was invited by Kirk Varnado, who was then the chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, to organize an exhibition based on the museum's permanent collection. This was part of a series called Artist's Choice, and Murray was the fifth artist to be invited to curate such an exhibition. She was also the first woman chosen, and she chose in her exhibition, which was larger than those of the men who preceded her, uh, she chose to only display work by women in the show. Uh, she called it Modern Women. Later, in an interview, she spoke about the experience of making the exhibition, which took over a year. She reflected on the process, noting that the vaults of the Museum of Modern Art were full of work by painters who were once prominent, but who had been largely forgotten, including, quote, hundreds of Pavel Cechlus, hundreds of works by Ilya Bolotowski, end quote. For Murray, this sparked a realization of, quote, how fast people come and go, how fast they are forgotten. Incidentally, our collection includes an excellent and characteristic work by Bolotowski, which is included in the exhibition, so you'll get a chance to spend some time with it. Um, as Murray suggests in that quote, Bolotowski was someone at the center of the art world uh, who was largely forgotten after his heyday in the 1930s and early 1940s, and who now is remembered more or less fitfully, mostly by art historians interested in that period and other nerds. And that gets to a key insight about the history of modern art, which is that the story of modernism, like all stories, it's a story that is told. People create it out of the raw material of history. Also like other stories about the past, it is contingent. It changes based on the wants, needs, and interests of the people who are telling it. Murray's story is particularly poignant as well because of the sheer, sheer scale of what she's considering. There are hundreds of works by Bolotowski in Chelichu in storage, which hints at a number of things, not least of which is the massive size of the MoMA's collections. One is prompted to ponder just how many of the museum's 150,000 plus objects fall into that same semi-forgotten category. This isn't to say that MoMA is unique in this regard or that it's neglecting its collections. Instead, it's simply a fact of life in the museum world that there are usually more objects in the collection than space on the walls. At some bigger museums, I think the percentage of work on display is less than 1% um, at any given time. I don't know what it is for the RMA, but we have a sizable collection, and so a lot of the works can't be shown at any one time. And busy curators only have so much time to learn about these objects besides. And that's why the project that was funded by the Luce uh, Foundation was so wonderful, because it gave me a chance to conduct research on even obscure artists like this one, Henry Botkin. This painting isn't in the exhibition, but Botkin is an interesting figure nonetheless. Having taught his cousin George Gershwin to paint, 
as well as purchasing works of art for Gershwin's personal collection while Botkin was in Paris. And this painting was likely made while Botkin and Gershwin were traveling together in South Carolina, which is a trip that would eventually result in Gershwin writing Porgy and Thess. And you can see in this painting the similar sort of um, references to jazz music that Botkin is kind of rhyming with his sort of late Cubist style. Uh, and so Botkin was never really as prominent as Bolotowski, and he's probably even more obscure now than Bolotowski. That doesn't mean, however, that he doesn't have an interesting place in the history of modernism in the United States, even if it's a somewhat minor one. And that's what's so exciting about the approach I've tried to model with this exhibition. By focusing on a broader array of artists and their stories, we can gain a richer understanding of the United States and its art worlds. <clears throat> Painters like Bolotowski and Botkin are consigned to a kind of historical marginality. Their story is more or less forgotten. Why is that? After all, it's not something that just happened. As I said, history is contingent. It's told. It was the result of a more or less active process. And basically what happened is that a single story came to dominate our understanding of modernism. Uh, for those of you who took an art history class at some point, or even if you've just spent a lot of time at museums, especially certain ones, you're probably familiar with this story. But at the same time, I think it's worth our time to lay it out again, quickly but reasonably thoroughly, because telling it will help us examine it anew to see what it emphasizes and what it leaves out. And that story usually starts with this man, Edward Manet. And it very often starts with this painting, which is called Olympia. This work is important for a number of reasons, including both its subject matter, what it depicts, and its formal qualities, how it depicts them. Basically, I want to be frank, Olympia is a sex worker. On its own, this fact is not actually remarkable. Painters had long used sex workers as models because posing in the nude was considered unfit for women from more genteel strata of society. But they, the painters, usually disguised this fact, recasting these women as nymphs or goddesses or whatever. Manet, on the other hand, makes it quite clear how Olympia earns her living. Uh, and in fact, this is um, a, a specific woman uh, whose name escapes me at the moment, but um, you know she has an interesting history and there's lots of scholarship on her. So uh, if you're interested, you can look into that. Uh, but Manet, uh, even more shockingly, he depicts her as unashamed of her line of work. She gazes out at us, the viewers, coolly and levelly. She forces us to reckon with her lack of shame, a shame which we, and here we are educated and wealthy white men, mostly French, believe she should feel. So from its outset, modernism is characterized by a frankness of subject matter, a refusal to engage in flights of fant fantasy. The other thing that Manet does when he paints Olympia, her maid and her surroundings is to use flat, thin expanses of paint. Uh, he denies the sensuousness of her body, kind of melds into another decorative surface, another flat, uh, featureless surface. Um, and the surfaces more generally, he denies the, the richness of all these silks that surround her. Um, and in its way, this move is as revolutionary as his frankness about Olympia's vocation. Manet is seeking something other than verisimilitude, something other than the representation of a window onto the world. He is instead insisting on his agency as a painter, his ability to manipulate the effects of the surface to his own, sometimes inscrutable or confrontational, ends. And it was these twin moves, the frank depiction of the modern world and an experimentation with the nature of the picture plane, which would characterize much of modern painting. And that these even inform my investigation in this exhibition, though as she, we shall see, I hope I've put a slightly different spin on these things. After that, we get a parade of isms that define that er-ism, modernism. Impressionists continued to investigate modern life, particularly the cities, while ambitiously experimenting with the picture plane, this time by combining that insistent flatness with the optical effects created by using small strokes of pure color that came from tubed paint. And this invention of paint in tubes is another sort of driving feature of modernism. Um, painters no longer had to mix their own pigments, but could use bright manufactured ones right from the tube. Quantalism, or neo-impressionism, takes impressionism's optical tendencies somewhat to an extreme while continuing to investigate modern urban subject matter. And then comes post-impressionism, represented by Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh, 
both of whom continue to explore the limits of the picture plane and the optical effects of paint, though they do so less with an eye to modern life than to modern subjectivity, that, that is, the interior life of a person living in the modern world. And the post-impressionist advances of Van Gogh, Gauguin, and others are followed by further expressionisms, explorations of the individual psyche, including most prominently that of the fauves or wild beasts led by Henri Matisse. Meanwhile, a Spanish prodigy named Pablo Picasso is investigating similar themes, including the alienation of modern life, plus the aesthetics of so-called primitive societies in the global South, using that to begin to break the picture plane into small areas of flat color. Together, Picasso and a French painter named Georges Braque develop cubism, which attempts to render three-dimensional objects in two dimensions by breaking them into little flat planes that absolutely insist on their own two-dimensionality. This is modernist flatness going to extremes, barely maintaining any sort of reference to the actual object to the world. You can just about make out bits of the guitar or of the man, but it, it's really flattened, really abstracted. Uh, and another thing that incidentally I, I like to point out is that you'll notice that MoMA has a date on this painting of summer 1911 to early 1912. And the development of cubism has been so intensely studied, so argued over, that scholars have found it useful to date these paintings, not just by the year, but by the season, even the month or the day, so that they can trace Cubism's development literally from one work to the next. And so in that way, it's not inaccurate to say that Cubism is the center around which the art, the dominant story of 20th century art revolves. Everything is constantly about the relationship back to Cubism. Um, Elizabeth Murray talks about her relationship with um, with Picasso, you know, this is, this is really a big deal. So anyway, following Cubism's experiments with extreme flattening of the picture plane, a number of artists working in Europe achieve what we now call full or true abstraction. Uh, and the, the words, the word true is, I think, a really indicative one of what we're, what we're sort of driving towards here. Um, so, and this happens just before World War I. Painting has ceased to reference the outside world at all, instead becoming concerned with purely formal or pictorial effects. Not all modernist or avant-garde painters will be abstract, but abstraction becomes a key preoccupation of many, as well as of critics. Just after the war, artists disillusioned by the pointless bloodshed begin to investigate an overlapping series of concerns, including dreams and the unconscious, to create works that seek to deny, suppress, or destroy the rationality of modern society. These artists are variously categorized under the rubrics of Dada and Surrealism, and there is significant overlap between the two. Some work in abstraction and others in a more figurative mode, but they share an exhaustion with the idea that painting and other forms of art can depict any sort of reality or objective truth. Then, as the story goes, most of the European modern artists flee Paris by 1940 when the Nazis occupy France. They end up in New York where they encounter a rising group of American painters who have been training in a mix of the prevailing American regionalist style and various European avant-garde, like cubism, surrealism. This encounter produces Jackson Pollock and the other abstract expressionists, and New York qu quickly becomes the new capital of modern art. With this shift comes an increasing emphasis on abstraction to the exclusion of virtually all other styles and techniques. From then on, the story of modern art, as it's traditionally told, is an American one and largely excludes developments outside of New York. And the story goes on from there, encompassing the shift from abstract expressionism to color field and related movements, neo-data, pop, minimalism. It's in the 1960s with pop and then minimalism that we start to think about the end of modernism and the beginning of whatever it is that comes next, whether that's postmodernism, late modernism, contemporary art, or whatever the term one prefers. I, I like to joke that there's as many terms as there are art historians working today, and probably more. Uh, the key thing, and the reason that I spent some time laying this story out, is that this story of modernism has certain biases and blind spots. Most notably, it's centered first on Paris, then on New York. And even when the artists are not French, or later American, they are often working in one of those two capitals. And also, this story increasingly is centered on masterpieces, and I use the term advisedly, but it's, it's a, a common term, uh, held in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art itself, with the exception of the first couple, the Manet and the um, Impression Sunrise, uh, 
that I showed all those other works were from MoMA's collection. Uh, and the story, which preoccupied art historians for so long, and which continues to resonate in the broader culture, is thus quite narrow. It concerns a group of artists who are essentially all white, who are mostly men, and who live in a handful of cities in a small handful of countries, all of them in those industrialized nations that like to call themselves the West. And at the center of it in so many ways is MoMA, which has just been incredibly influential in the development of this story. So it's notable that in the 90s, MoMA was having artists like Elizabeth Murray into trouble or expand that narrow view of the canon. Because as Murray discovered, the museum, like all museums really, had collected a great deal of work that it originally thought would be important, but which had kind of fallen to the wayside, abandoned in some way. And some of these exclusions were based on gender, as Murray quickly noted, but that wasn't the only reason. Volotowski himself was excluded because the American preference quickly moved from the kind of geometric abstraction he practiced to the more surrealist derived style of Pollock and his colleagues in the New York school. If Volotowski is all about orderliness, right angles, math, Pollock is, um, it's about a kind of freer, more expressionistic, personal sort of view of painting. <clears throat> Other artists were excluded uh, because of American racism and European racism too, but we're moving now to a more American aspect of these stories. Jacob Lawrence, for example, was modern in both the senses I identified with my discussion of Edouard Manet. He depicted life in the 20th century United States, including his home in Harlem, as in this painting, and his service in the Coast Guard, and most famously, the great migration of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North. His style, though, was also modern. He was a careful student of both historical and contemporary art. And this comparison with a very large uh, Picasso from 1921 is indicative of Lawrence's adoption of a modernist style. In the early years of Cubism, what we generally refer to as analytic Cubism, the style was marked by a generally subdued, even monochromatic brown and gray palette. But as it developed, uh, and figures other than Picasso and Brock began contributing to it, it eventually developed into a much more brightly colored version of itself, albeit one still characterized by flatness and the concordant suppression of illusionistic space. Lawrence adopted this style for his depictions of Afro-American life and African-American life in history. But when critics and scholars first encountered his work, they couldn't see its relationship to Picasso and other great figures of contemporary European art. Instead, they saw a primitive whose work bore a closer relationship to the jungle than it did to the intellectually than it did to intellectually rigorous modern painting. For example, when it was reviewing paintings from this early Harlem-focused period of his career, the New York Sun said, quote, he is particularly easy in his use of color, which is so uninhibited and tropical they might have come straight from the African equator without any delusions in Harlem. So Lawrence's career was long and distinguished and he would eventually force critics and other members of the art world establishment to recognize his skill and his relationship to other modernists. But he was not afforded his place in the ranks of, the, of these modernists without a struggle. <clears throat> and incidentally, I'd like to mention that this work by Lawrence is not in the exhibition, not because I don't think he's modern, but simply because the work is not available. Um, like all works on paper, and this is a, uh, a gouache on a piece of paper, uh, the work is very light sensitive and can only be displayed a fraction of the time in order to preserve it for future generations. So I'm glad I got a chance to share it with you all here, and I urge you to keep an eye out for it next time it hangs on the walls. It's a really, really wonderful painting from a really um, like absolutely crucial moment in Lawrence's career. So it's awesome that we have it at the museum. Okay, so <clears throat> as I've been talking about these artists who were left out of that old canonical story, you probably have started to get a sense that things have been changing. Indeed, I'm not the first one to point out the gaps and exclusions in that history. Scholars, curators, artists, and members of the public have been engaged in a careful series of efforts over the last few decades to right these wrongs to gain a fuller understanding of what exactly was modernism. And this exhibition is joining in that conversation and it is doing it in particular from the perspective of the Rollins Museum of Arts collection. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a particularly auspicious moment for this sort of investigation because we here at the RMA are thinking quite a bit about how we might wanna present the collection in the future. And that's what I've had in mind 
as I've developed this exhibition, as Anna mentioned, a kind of case study of how the museum's collection might look in the future. Uh, so I'd like to give the, spend the rest of my time giving you a sense of how you'll experience the show once you head into Clive when it opens in a few weeks. And by the way, remember a moment ago when I spoke about the fragility of works on paper? This exhibition includes a large number of such works, all of which are as fragile as a Lawrence. We're thus planning to rotate half of them midway through in January. So if you get a chance, visit the exhibition in the fall and then again during the spring, because you get to see a lot of new work. Um, that said, I've decided to start the exhibition at the end with these three works, all of which will be up for the whole time, September to May. Uh, modernism as a concept and a movement is this big contested thing that dominated artistic and other conversations for a hundred years or more, from the middle of the 19th century to sometime in the second half of the 20th. And scholars can never fully agree on when it, when it ends. One way to think about how it ends, however, is to think about what might come next. I'm not suggesting that there's agreement about that either, as I said, but examining what came next can help us like, clarify what we mean when we talk about modernism. One way in which we often think about the end of modernism is in terms of the series of theories and discourses called postmodernism. Despite its name, which implies that postmodernism is simply whatever has come after modernism, this is a notoriously tricky thing to pin down. The most helpful way to think about it for me is this. Remember that story I told you about the history of modernism? Manet begats Impressionism, begats Post-Impressionism, et cetera, et cetera. The way that story goes in a linear fashion from one thing to the next says something important about modernism because the way that the story proceeds matches the way that modernist discourses see the world, in particular, its history. Modernism, at its core, is about progress. It's often called teleological, meaning there's a continuous moment from one point to the next. And implied in that notion of progress is one of improvement, of, uh, of a continual refinement. Advocates of modernism, the most famous of which was probably the critic Clement Greenberg, were, are, in some cases, invested in the idea that art was constantly improving, moving towards a kind of final point. And that final point was usually seen as a kind of perfectly flat painting, one which denies its very materiality in favor of a completely intellectual existence. So turning to this mixed media work by Whitfield Lovell, uh, who I believe is the youngest artist in the exhibition, well, we can see that this isn't that. Instead, we have a work of art which insists on its materiality in a variety of ways. First, it's made of real stuff, textured wood, an old radio. It also refuses abstraction. There's this big hand-drawn picture of a woman. Uh, instead of consisting almost entirely of surface, the image has depths. It prompts physical engagement. Don't touch it, but think about it. Um, it's also deeply concerned with history, but not on the grand public history of great men, but and significant events like wars and treaties. Instead, this history is quiet, individual. And that's because Lovell based his works on a personal archive of black vernacular photograph photo photographs that he has accumulated from places like flea markets. He translates those photographs into charcoal drawings on reclaimed wood panels, also sometimes incorporating found objects, in particular radios. The resulting works thus engage and activate a variety of discourses, including history, objecthood, and through the practice of using found objects, the history of modernism itself, found objects being, you'll remember, important to Dada and related modernist discourses. So anyway, to return to our definition of postmodernism then, we might say that if modernism is all about progress, cir circularity, uh, sorry, progress, certainty, and flatness, and also the primacy of painting above all, postmodernism might be about circularity, uncertainty, and depth. It denies the linear one step after another type of history that is so central to the story of modernism. It also embraces a variety of mediums, including found objects, traditional techniques, video, conceptual art, and a dizzying blend of all those. So one way to think about modernism is to call it everything that was happening before artists like Lovell came onto the scene and disrupted it. This work by a Miami-based artist named Purvis Young provides another way we might interrogate the idea and history of modernism. Young, like Lovell, was African-American. Unlike Lovell, who is Young's junior, however, uh, 
Young was not afforded status as a serious artist until very late in his life and career, if he ever was. The reason for that is due to a feature of modernism, which I mentioned earlier, which is its intellectual aspects. Modern artists considered themselves intellectuals, serious ones. They are the reason for so many of, of the artistic stereotypes we continue to hold dear. All those isms, you may recall, are often referred to as schools of painting. The idea of intellect driving art is right the where, there in the way we talk about it. And I want to be clear here. I am not saying Young's antidote to modernism comes from his lack of intellectual seriousness. It's quite the opposite, actually. Purvis Young was as driven by ideas as any artist, but he lacked something that most modernists had. Specifically, he lacked formal training. It's not quite right. He was mostly self-trained, and he may have had a bit more formal training while he was incarcerated during uh, his early life in the, in the 60s. But that's not the kind of formal training. That's not the Yale School of Art or even a liberal arts college. That's something very different. Um, mostly, whether or not he was trained, he charted his own artistic path. Like other artists, he studied the work of earlier uh, painters, in particular Van Gogh, Rembrandt, and El Greco, um, as well as his more recent artists, fellow artist activists like Obasi, the artists of Obasi and Afrocobra. But he did so not as part of institutions like schools or universities, but rather at his own direction in the Miami Public, Miami Public Library and by watching documentaries on television and listening to the radio. And so I think you can see the influence of all these artists here, in particular um, in the kinetic wavering of these masses of people, which denotes to me El Greco, or in the striking sea, uh, green blue of the sea in the panel uh, from the bottom here. Uh, which reminds me both of the wonderful blue greens of Van Gogh and also um, sort of some of this, the Baroque seascapes he might have been looking at. Um, this is a man who was serious about art, but due to his race, his socioeconomic economic status, and his lack of formal education, his seriousness was easy to overlook. And artists like him were overlooked continually and throughout the 20th century. So that's another way to think about the bounds of modernism. With a few exceptions, like the French painter Henri Rousseau, who was championed by Picasso and others, modern artists all came from similar bourgeois, educated backgrounds. And it's only been recently that the art world has begun to understand these exclusions and seek to rectify them. By appearing at the beginning of this exhibition, then, Young helps us to keep those exclusions in mind as we explore the collection uh, as I've displayed it for the exhibition. <clears throat> The third and final contemporary or after modern work I've included is by this painter, Carmen Herrera. This one is borrowed from the Alphon collection, Alphon collection of contemporary art. Uh, and by the way, my colleague Abigail Goodman has made a uh, further selection of works from that collection to be on display at the inn during the time the, the American Modernism's exhibition is up. So be sure to head over and check that out. Her selections really highlight the ways in which uh, the concerns of so many of these modern artists still resonate with today's generations. Anyway, Herrera is especially interesting for my purposes. As you see, the work is indeed quite recent, dating from 2013. And yet that dating is somewhat deceptive, at least as far as her relationship to modernism is concerned. Why? Because Herrera, who, who was born in 1915, painted it when she was 98 years old. In fact, she's still alive, still active as a painter, and she's been making works like this since the late 40s or early 50s. She was, as it turns out, one of the very first artists in the world to start working in this style, which we now might call hard edge painting, in which careful use of masking tape and acrylic paint allows the artist to achieve these just incredibly sharp lines. Another painter who's famous for this sort of work, one you've probably heard of, is Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, Herrera and Kelly were living in Paris at the same time when they independently invented this style of painting. It may seem hard to believe it was truly independent, but it seems so. Neither of them has ever claimed to have known the other during that time, uh, but they were making these sorts of works and exhibiting them around town. They also both moved back to New York by 1956 or so, and Kelly immediately got a one-man show at Betty Parsons Gallery, which was well known as the place that showed Jackson Pollock and the other abstract expressionists. Uh, he was an immediate star, in other words. And Herrera, whose work, and I cannot really emphasize this enough, can sometimes seem indistinguishable from Kelly's if you're just looking at the paintings, was not so fortunate. She did exhibit in New York, but only in group shows and usually with only Cuban and other Latinx artists. She mostly toiled in obscurity, continuing to develop her hard-edged, 
controlled aesthetic. It's only been very late in her life during this century that she's finally started to be recognized as the pioneer that she was. So in other words, Herrera is as modernist as they come, but due to her gender and ethnicity, she was not seen in that way until it was nearly too late. And so I wanted to include her at the beginning of the exhibition to serve as a reminder of both what has been lost by the racist and sexist histories we've inherited, but also the fact that there is no easy boundary between modernism and whatever came next. And a few of these modernists are still with us, still even creating work that speaks to these concerns of the flatness, the newness, and of modern life. So that's what you'll see when you walk into Clive on either side of the entrance from the main hallway of the museum. And then proceeding along the, the parallel walls, you'll see the two central strands of the exhibition. And they're represented by these two works by African-American artists, Al Loving and Emery Douglas. For those of you who came to my lecture at the beginning of the summer, the one where I explored the results of my Loose Foundation sponsored research, you may remember that I compared these two somewhat extensively back then, and I'm not gonna do that again, but it remains an important one. Along one wall of the gallery, to your left, no, to your right, you'll see a group of works that I've categorized as the figurative tradition. Douglas is one of those. And then on to your left, you'll see the abstract tradition, which includes loving. Modern art, the way I see it, got its start with figurative work. Works which used the visual tools of traditional art making to depict the modern world or one or more versions of it. John Sloan is one of the quintessential artists in this mode, both celebrated and reviled by his contemporaries for depicting the raw stuff of urban life rather than the rarefied allegorical beauty that many still expected of artists in the first decade of the 20th century. And then across the gallery from these works will be works in the abstract tradition. When we think of modern art today, we likely think of abstract art in part because of the tireless advocacy of artists like Esfir Slobodkina, who was Ilya Bolotowski's colleague in the group called American Abstract Artists. Funnily enough, however, Slobodkina herself was an artist who was eclipsed by younger generations, a victim of the changing tastes of her fellow Am Americans and modernists. Clement Greenberg, that great champion of abstract expressionism, had singled Slobodkina out for praise in the 1940s, but as the lively brushstrokes of de Kooning and the whorls of paint of Jackson Pollock took over, she fell out of favor, only to be revived by a later generation that included Kelly and Herrera. So these works and more will be hanging across from one another, hopefully prompting visitors to consider the push and pull between figuration and abstraction that animated artistic life during the 20th century. So back to Loving and Douglas. I also hope these juxtapositions will prompt reflection on the ways in which these two categories are less meaningful than the somewhat frequent rancor between the two camps indicates. I really like this pairing for that very reason, because I look at these two works, I can't help but see their affinities. Douglas seems, consciously or not, to have adopted something of Loving's careful, hard-edged style, in particular in the slashing, chevron-like forms over which the Black Panther is about to crawl. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, when I last saw you all, I was in the middle of giving my lecture and had a concurrent hurricane warning and fire alarm happen in my office here in Blacksburg, Virginia. Luckily, I'm okay and everyone's okay. And so now I'm gonna finish the lecture from where I think I left off and um, answer one very good question that I got uh, from one of you last night. And then um, through the magic of post-production, We'll stitch the videos together and uh, you'll have the full lecture. So um, thank you for your understanding as I saved my life. <laughs> All right, so I believe I was on um, back on this juxtaposition between Al Loving and Emery Douglas. Um, I think that these juxtapositions, uh, or I hope that they will prompt reflections on the ways in which these two categories, uh, which is to say abstraction and figuration, are less meaningful than the somewhat frequent rancor between the two camps indicates. I really like the pairing for this reason, because as I look at these two works, I can't help but see their affinities. Uh, I'm looking for my cursor here. I'm not finding it. Oh, well. Douglas seems, consciously or not, to have adopted something of Loving's careful, hard-edged style, in particular in these slashing, chevron-like forms over which the Black Panther is about to crawl. Um, I've also used this opportunity to complicate the idea of abstraction versus figuration in another way. This work by Ralston Crawford will be hanging in the figurative section. 
while this work by Wolf Kahn will be in the abstract section. Uh, the comparison is wonderful, I think. Both of these are landscapes, representing real places. In the case of Crawford, his subject is Savannah Harbor, while Kahn's is a stand of trees somewhere along the Delaware River. And the thing that's interesting about these two is that, despite what seems readily apparent when looking at the works, Crawford is the one whose artistic background, or pedigree, if you will, is in the figurative tradition. He came to prominence during a time when precisionism and other cubist-derived modernisms were ascendant before turning almost but not quite to full abstraction later in his career, in part as a response to his traumatic experiences during World War II and just after. He was the only artist actually present at the uh, destruction of Bikini Atoll, for example. Kahn, meanwhile, trained with the legendary German emigre and teacher Hans Hoffmann, whose eponymous schools in New York and on Cape Cod helped give flight to the careers of a large number of second and third generation abstract expressionists, including Kahn himself. Unlike others of Hoffmann's students, however, Kahn never really embraced full abstraction, instead using the understanding of form he gained from studying with Hoffmann to aid his understanding of the landscape. We can see it in this pastel as he builds up the various elements out of the wisps of pure color creating a series of blocky suggestions of water, grass, and trees more than he does represent them. Um, and so this is just really great to me because the Cro if you looked at these two works, you might think that Crawford was the abstract painter and Kahn the figurative. And in a sense, that's true. But in another sense, um, the way that they were trained, the way that they came to prominence was actually uh, opposite in a lot of ways. So finally, there's one final section which you'll see on the back wall opposite the entrance to Clive Gallery. I expect, or at least hope, that your attention will be drawn to it as soon as you walk in. And I'm using this 19th century American painting by Samuel F. B. Morse, the same one who invented the telegraph, by the way, um, as a kind of illustration of what it will look like. For this back wall, we're going to do what's called a salon-style hang, so named after the great national art exhibitions called Salons of 19th and early 20th century Paris. This is a really striking way of hanging objects, and I've chosen it for a couple reasons. And one is that it helps me indulge in my greed, maximizing the number of works I'm able to show in the exhibition. The other is for intellectual emphasis, however, because all of the works hanging in this salon style are going to be prints. Specifically, all are going to be prints dating from the era that we call the print revival. I showed you prints already in this lecture. The museum collects heavily in prints, as do most museums. The reasons for that are many, but big ones are that there are more prints than paintings out there, which means that there are more opportunities for supporters to make donations of prints, or for curators to purchase them. Prints are the backbones of many museum collections just for that reason. Prints are also important to modernism. The early modernists, like Sloan in particular, were deeply invested in printmaking as an artistic medium, rather than a merely reproductive one. That is, in the 19th century, most prints were used to replicate larger oil paintings. Around the end of the century and into the 20th, however, artists began making prints which were intended to stand out on their own as works of art. With the rise of abstract expressionism, though, the prints came, began to be less prominent once again. As I've mentioned, uh, the generation known as the abstract expressionists prioritized painting above all, seeing it as the purest expression of the artistic intellect. This print, for example, is one of the very few that Hans Hoffmann ever made. And that began to change, however, around 1957, when a woman named Tatiana Grossman founded a company called Universal Limited Art Editions on Long Island, which was an easy commute for New York artists. Soon, she was attracting those artists, mostly second and third generation abstract expressionists, and later followers, to work with her. She also inspired others who began founding other print shops, including Tamarin, Gemini GEL, and others. You've probably heard of some of them. And this led to what has been called the printmaking revival in the United States, with artists taking printmaking seriously in increasing numbers. And the most famous example of this trend is probably Andy Warhol, of course, who made printmaking central to his practice from early in his career, when he was working as a commercial artist. He famously retired from painting to fo focus exclusively on prints later on, preferring silkscreen because of its commercial connotations and ability to help him transform himself into a machine, which he said was one of his goals as an artist. For other artists, like D Jim Dine, however, printmaking is an avenue to greater experimentation, to variance. Dine tries to push the various printmaking mediums as far as they will go, using both traditional techniques and more outlandish ones, like attacking his etching plates with angle grinders and other power tools to achieve something totally new. And so for this um, 
blue wash for robes, for example, I believe there are only 17 of these in the edition, which is quite small, and each one of them is a little bit different because he's actually, um, in addition to printing them, he's done handwork on the prints themselves. So um, he's really made them into almost like drawings or paintings in addition to prints. So that's just a preview of the range of printmaking techniques you'll see. I think it'll be a great showcase for the depth, breadth, and richness of the collection. And the salon style hang of the printmaking revival section will be totally rotated in January, too. So it'll give the exhibition new freshness at the midpoint. Uh, it's my sincere hope that you'll come back to see it, making new connections and visiting old friends alike. So this is the point when I would normally say I hope to see you on opening night or the first day, but Alas, I will not be there, uh, not just because of COVID either. My wife and I are expecting the birth of our daughter right around that time, so I won't be able to travel. Still, I look forward to hearing what you think of the exhibition, and who knows, maybe you'll see me, my wife, and, and our baby in the galleries next spring, when I hope we can come down and see it in person. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy the exhibition. And now, for the Q&A section, such as it is. So, uh, Mary Alina asked a really great question in the chat that she then expanded in an email to Dr. Heller um, afterwards. And so uh, the question has multiple threads, um, and I'd like to kind of, uh, you know, go through it uh, piece by piece. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to pause my recording here, I think. Okay, and so here I've uh, copy and pasted the question. You can see it's a long multi-part one uh, into the, um, the PowerPoint here. And so I'm just going to kind of go through sort of point by point and answer as best I can. I hope that these answers provide some uh, rich nuance and, um, and, and additional information. And I really appreciate the question because uh, Mary Lynn is absolutely right in saying, in, in seeing that my, my exhibition is really in many ways all about the idea of labels and labeling artists and artworks. So on the question of labels, um, labels are often a posteriori, um, though not always. But a good example of that is the Hudson River School, uh, going back well before the period of question in the exhibition, but one very dear to my heart uh, as someone who started in the 19th century. Um, so the art historian Angela Miller in her uh, seminal 1992 book, Empire of the Eye, uh, calls the Hudson River School, that group of landscape painters who lived and worked uh, in, in and around New York City in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, uh, she calls them the first New York school. Uh, and she did, in contrast with the abstract expressionists who were always called the New York school at the time. And so she does that as a kind of historical move to foreground that the abstract expressionists, or I'm sorry, that the Hudson River School are really a, a school of painters based in and around New York City, that New York City is important to their existence. So that's a kind of label um, that comes from an art historian who's seeking to bring greater clarity to um, a school that actually uh, has much more nuance than the Hudson River, because of course the, the painters of the Hudson River School also worked in New England, in Vermont, and, and especially uh, New Hampshire's White Mountains, uh, and in Maine, on the, um, the coastal islands, but they also worked in the West, uh, Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran, working in um, Colorado and Wyoming and Arizona and California. So, um, you know, there's a lot more to the, the story than, than the Hudson River, and that's why uh, Dr. Miller made that distinction. Um, sometimes labels are a product of art critics at the time, and they're often pejorative. Uh, disapproving critics coined the terms ashcan school, meaning that th these painters show the filthy ash cans of the city, as opposed to the good, beautiful subjects that they're supposed to. Impressionism, uh, after Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise, but impression meaning um, a pejorative in the sense that it's like, oh, just an impression rather than a finished work. Uh, and then Fauvism, wild beasts, this brightly expressive color used by Matisse and Derain and these Dufy, these other painters, um, seen as, uh, as too wild. And so the, the Fauves were called the wild beasts. Um, and then sometimes labels come from uh, artists themselves, as Mary Alina says. And a great example of that is the Black Power and the Black Arts Movement. So this is a group of artists, not just painters and visual artists, but also playwrights and musicians and so many others, poets, who want to um, uh, 
define a black aesthetic, a, a, a way of, of celebrating blackness as a corrective to the lack of blackness in mainstream or white um, cultures. Um, so then Mary Lena goes to ask, in art history, can you pinpoint one or more instances when something outside of the art field triggered the naming or renaming of a movement? And, you know, I struggled with this one a little bit. I think an imperfect example is the 1989 and early 1990s uh, NEA-NEH controversy. Uh, some of you might remember there were artists who were supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, such as Andre Serrano, Robert Maplethorpe, and others. And they were, these, these artists, um, uh, in the case of Serrano, who is dealing with um, with uh, a kind of um, desire to shock, but also to interrogate a kind of post-Christian or or um, or similar sort of aesthetic, and Maplethorpe, who is who's exploring uh, his queer sexuality of his community, um, they were deemed offensive by certain members of Congress and and cultural critics like uh, Lynn Cheney, Jesse Helms, uh, the Catholic League, and. And so they were, they were used as cudgels with which to try to defund um, some of these federal arts institutions. And I, I don't know that there was, um, there's a label that we might say, or a movement that they were named as, except that these people called them offensive and anti-Christian and all these sorts of things. Um, interestingly, actually, the, um, the great art, art critic and, and art historian and educator, Sister Wendy, who had the, the show um, on television, she didn't think that Serrano was being anti Christian, but rather uh, highlighting what um, people have done to Christ in in their um, their sort of worldly sinful ways. So um, a very perceptive uh, and practicing Catholic critic uh, managed to see something that a lot of the detractors of Serrano's work couldn't. Um, anyway, so uh, but usually the question of art of naming art movements is uh, one that that critics, artists, and art historians kind of tend to keep in. In the house, so to speak, but uh, it occasionally erupts out into the broader culture, though usually, unfortunately, in a sort of negative way. Um, uh, she then goes on to ask, was there a time when uh, the naming or renaming of a movement made art periods more inclusive? And what comes to mind for me is the downtown scene of the 1980s. Um, you may know that in the 80s in, in New York City, there were all sorts of artists, performance artists, street artists, musicians, poets, painters, photographers, filmmakers, uh, all living and working together in um, sort of ad hoc spaces, DIY spaces, sort of um, even living on the streets in downtown New York. Uh, they were, this community was multiracial. It was often queer um, from diverse economic backgrounds, which is often not the case in the art world. Um, and they shared this ethos of DIY, of punk, of new social formations, of anti-capitalist social formations. And so rather than segregate themselves by medium or style, uh, you know, you have, you have graffiti slash street artists like, like Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, you know, playing in bands together also and, um, and, and collaborating with, uh, with realist photographers like Nan Golden. Um, rather than segregate themselves by all these different styles, they all sort of were radically inclusive. They were a community. And so rather than talking about the painters as separate from the poets, as separate from the video artists, we, we see a kind of uh, downtown scene that, that, that's all about this collaborative uh, ethos. And so that's a way in which a naming, um, just after the place where they all lived and worked, can really um, foster these great connections and these great evoke these great um, congruences. And then finally, to what extent, in my experience, can labels, definitions, and categories promote or delimit interpretations? Um, so going off my last answer, inclusive labels can be really great. Downtown is such a great example of a label that helps to promote an interpretation that I think is uh, very warranted about the, the material. And for a good counterexample, I suppose there's minimalism, um, one of the movements that comes sort of just before the downtown. Uh, explosion. So artists tend to really chafe at this. They, they often chafe at a lot of these um, labels, but minimalism is one that is particularly hard to stick. Artists don't like to be called minimal, minimalist, generally. Um, they don't think it's a useful way. They want to be seen as individuals. But at the same time, you know, Robert Morris, Donald Judd, etc., really do share certain aesthetic and philosophical concerns. And so the problem is when you get into the idea of purity, what is really minimalism? Like, um, 
the museum, and I, I should have put this in the slide, but you can go look it up on the, uh, on the website, has this really great painting by Rosemary Castoro um, that, that I would absolutely call minimalist in many of its engagements. And it, it, it um, engages with many of the same ideas as Morris, Andre, um, Judd, but she is often excluded from the canon of minimalism for a couple of reasons. One is that painters have often been excluded from minimalism, which is supposed to be all about uh, objecthood rather than surfaces. And women have, even among art movements, really been um, excluded from minimalism. Um, minimalism has been a really macho, really chauvinist sort of movement. And so um, so the, the narrow bands of what we consider minimalism has has really limited, I think, our understanding of art in the late 60s and into the 70s. And scholars have begun um, really pushing back on that. Um, there's a really great essay called Minimalism and Biography by, um, by the art historian Anna Chave, which uh, goes into this. And there have been more recent works as well. So if you're interested in that, that might be something to check out. So uh, thank you, Mary Elena, for such a great question. And I'm sorry if you had one and you didn't get to it. Um, you can reach out to Anna or, or Hisela, and um, they will get your questions to me, and I'd be happy to answer them in uh, an email message. But otherwise, I really hope you enjoyed the talk and, uh, and this second half of it in particular, and I hope to see you um, in the museum or to hear what you think of the exhibition. Okay, uh, bye.